The Cube presents Ignite 22. Brought to you by Palo Alto Networks. Hey, welcome back to Vegas. Great to have you. We're pleased that you're watching theCUBE, Lisa Martin and Dave Vellante. Day two of theCUBE's coverage of Palo Alto Ignite 22 from the MGM Grand. Dave, we're going to be talking about data. Oh, I love data. I do know you love survey data. data. You know. There is a great new survey that Palo Alto Networks just published yesterday. What's next in cyber? We're going to be digging through it with their CMO. Who better to talk about data with than a CMO that has a PhD in machine learning? We're very <laughs> pleased to welcome to the program Zainab Ozdemir, CMO of Palo Alto Networks. Great to have you, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. First, I got to ask you about your PhD. Your background as a CMO is so interesting and unique. Give me a little bit of a history on that. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, yes, I, I admit that I'm a little bit of an untraditional marketing leader. I spent uh, probably the first half of my career as a software engineer and a research scientist in the area of machine learning and speech signal processing, uh, which is very uncommon, I, <laughs> I admit that. Um, it, honestly, it has actually helped me immensely in my, in my current role. I mean, I, you know, you've spoken to Lee Claridge, I think, uh, a little while ago. Uh, we have a very tight and close partnership with product and engineering teams at Alto Networks, and um, you know, cybersecurity is a very complex topic, and we're at a critical juncture right now where all of these new technologies, AI, machine learning, cloud computing, are going to really transform the industry. And I think that I'm very lucky uh, as somebody who's very technically competent in, in all of those areas to, to partner with the best people and the leading company um, right now. So I, I'm, I'm very happy that my technical background is actually helping in this, in this journey. Oh, wait, aren't you like a molecular biologist? I'm a yeah. reformed yeah. molecular, yes. Yeah, okay. yes. My so well, there you Whoa, go. Okay. There you go. Yes. <laughs> but the math guy over here. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> you guys just did the story that I teased. It, the the amount of data in there is unbelievable. This is mm -hmm. just started in August, so a few mm -hmm. months ago. Yeah. Fresh data. You surveyed 1,300 CXOs globally. That's right. Across industries and organizations are saying, you know, hybrid work and remote work became status mm -hmm. quo like that. Yes. A couple years ago. Everyone shifted to, to multi-cloud, and of course the cyber criminals are sophisticated and they're motivated and they're well-funded. What right. are some of the things that you think that the survey really demonstrated mm -hmm. that validate the direction that Palo Alto Networks is going in? That's right, that's right. So, we do these surveys because first and foremost, we have to make sure we're aligned with our customers in terms of our product strategy and the direction. Uh, and we have to confirm and validate our very strong opinions about the, the future of the cybersecurity industry. So, um, but this time when we did this survey, we, we just saw some great insights and we decided we want to share it with the broader industry because we obviously want to drive thought leadership and make sure everybody is in the same level of field. Um, some interesting and significant results with this one. So as you said, this was 1,300 C-level cybersecurity decision makers and executives um, across the world. So we had uh, participants from Europe, from uh, Japan, from Asia Pacific, Latin America, in, in addition to North America. So one of the most significant um, stats or data points that we've seen was the fact that out of everybody uh, interviewed, 96% of participants had experienced one or more cybersecurity breaches in the past 12 months. That was more than what we expected, to be honest with you. Um, and then 57% of them actually experienced three or more. So that, that those stats are, are, are really worth sharing uh, in terms of where the state of cybersecurity is. What also was personally interesting to me uh, was 33% of them actually experienced an operational disruption as a result of a breach, uh, which is a big number, it's one third of, of participants. So all of these were very interesting. We asked them more detailed questions around you know, how many, like obviously all of them are trying to respond to this situation. They're trying different technologies, different tools, and it seems like they're, they're in a point where they almost have too many tools and technologies because you know, when you have too many tools and technologies, there's the operational overhead of integrating them. There, it creates blind spots between them because those tools aren't really communicating with each other. So what we, saw, what we heard from the responders was that on average they were on like 32 tools. Um, 22% was on 50 or more tools, which is crazy. Um, but what they, what the question we asked them was, you know, are you, 
are you looking to um, consolidate? Are you looking to go more tools or less tools? Like, what are your thoughts on that? And a, a significant um, majority of them, like about 77%, said they are actively trying to reduce the number of technologies that they're trying to use because they want to actually achieve better um, security outcomes. I wonder if you could comment on this. So in, early on in the pandemic, we have a partner, survey yeah. partner, ETR, yeah. yes. Enter Enterprise Technology Research, and we saw a real shift, of course, because of hybrid work, mm -hmm. toward um, endpoint security, cloud security. They were mm -hmm. re-architecting their networks, a new focus on you know, different mm -hmm. thinking about network security and identity. Yeah. And you play in all of those and you partner yeah. for identity. Yeah. I almost, my question is, is, was there kind of a knee-jerk reaction to get point tools to plug some of those holes? Yes. And now they're, because we said at the time, this is a permanent shift in thinking. What we didn't think through, mm -hmm. it's coming to focus here at this conference, is, okay, we did that, but now we created another problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yes, yes, you're very right, I think, and it's very natural sure. to do this, right? Every time a problem pops up, you want to fix it as, as quickly as possible, and you look, you survey uh, who can help you with that, and then you kind of get going, because cybersecurity is one of those areas where you can't really wait and do, you know, take time to, to fix those problems. So that happened a lot, um, and it, it is happening, but what happened as a result of that, for example, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a data point from the actual survey that answers this very question. When, I, when we asked these executives what keeps them at night, like up at night, like what's their biggest concern, uh, a significant majority of them said, oh, we're having difficulty with data management. And what that means is that all these tools that they've deployed, they're, they're generating a lot of insights and data, but they're disconnected, right? So there is no one place where you can say, look at it holistically and, and come to conclusions very fast about how threat actors are moving in an organization. So that's a direct result of this proliferation of tools, if you will, and you're right, and it, it's a natural thing to, to deploy products very quickly, but then you have to take a step back and say, how do I make this more effective? How do I bring things together, bring all my data together um, to be able to get to threats, detect threats much faster. An unintended consequence of that quick yeah. fix. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah. become cyber resilient. We've been hearing a lot about cyber resiliency yes. Yes. recently, and something that I was noting in the survey is that only 25% of execs said, yeah, our cyber resilience and readiness yeah. is high. And you found that there was a lack of alignment mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the boards and the executive mm -hmm. levels. And we actually spoke with, with um, I think BJ yesterday on how are you guys, and even some of your partners, yeah. how are you helping facilitate that alignment? We know yeah. security is always a board level yes. conversation, but the lack of alignment was kind of surprising yeah. to me. Well, I think the good news is that um, I think we, we cybersecurity is taking its place in board discussions more and more. Whether there's alignment or not, at least it's a topic, yeah. right? That's a, that's, that was also out of the survey that, that we saw. Um, I think, yes, we have, uh, we have a lot of, a big role to play in helping security executives communicate better uh, with boards and, and C-level executives in their organizations because, as we said, it's a very complex topic and and it has to be taken um, from two angles when, when there's it's a board level discussion. One, how are you reducing risk and making sure that you're resilient? Two, um, how, how do you think about return on investment and you know, what's the right level of investment and is that investment going to get us the return that we, we need? What do you think of this? So, uh, uh, there's another interesting stat in here, what keeps executives up at night? Mm -hmm. You mentioned difficulty of data management. Normally, the CISO response to what's your number one problem is lack of talent. Mm, so like, number now, three there, it, yes, it, yeah. And it is maybe somewhat related yeah. to difficulty of data management, but maybe people have realized, you know what, I'm never going to solve this problem by throwing bodies at it. Yeah. You know, I got to think of a better way to consolidate my data, maybe partner mm -hmm. with a company that can help me do that. And then the second one was security being left behind changes in the tech stack. So we're moving so fast to digitize. Yes. And security's still an afterthought. And so it's, it's almost as though they're kind of rethinking the problems because they know that they can't just solve the issue by throwing you know, more hires at it because they can't find the people. That is, the, you're absolutely spot on. Um, what the, the thing about cyber security skills gap, it's a, it's a real reality, it's very real. Um, it's, a, it's a hard place to be. It, it, it's hard to ramp up sometimes. Also, um, there's a, a lot of turnover. Uh, so, but you're, 
what you're right in the sense that a lot of the, the manual work that is needed uh, for, for cybersecurity, it's actually more sort of, much easier to tackle with machines yeah. uh, than, than humans. It's a funny double click on the stat you just gave. Um, in North America, uh, the responders, when we asked them like how they're tr coping with the skills shortage, they said we're automating more. So we're using more AI, we're using more process automation to make sure we do the heavy lifting with machines and then only present to, to the people what they're very good at in, is making judgments, right? Very sort of like last minute judgment calls. In uh, the other uh, parts of the world, uh, the top answer to that question is how you're tackling um, cybersecurity skills shortage was we're actually trying to provide higher wages and better benefits to, to the existing people. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a, a, a gap between the two, but I think, I think the world is moving towards the former, which is let's do as much as we can with uh, AI and machines and, and automation in general, and then let's make sure it's, we're more in an automation-assisted world versus a human-first world. We also saw in the survey that ransomware was <laughs> you know, the big concern in the United States, not, not as much, not that it's not a concern yeah. in other parts of the world, yeah. but it wasn't number one. Why do you think that is? Is it because the, maybe the U.S. has more to lose? Is it mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, more high profile? Or? Yeah, look, I mean, yes, you're right. So um, most responders said number one is ransomware. That's my biggest concern going into 2023. And it was for JPAC and I think EMEA uh, Europe, it was supply chain attacks. Right. Um, so, I think U.S. has been hit hard by ransomware in the past year. I think it's like fresh memory, uh, and, and that's why it rose to the top in, in various verticals. So, uh, so I'm not surprised with that outcome. I think the supply chain is, is more of a, uh, we've, you know, we've been hit hard globally by, by that, and it's very new. Yeah. So I think a lot of the European and JPAC responders are uh, responding to it from a perspective of, this is a problem I still don't know how to solve, you know, like, and it's like, I, I need the right infrastructure to, and, and I need the right visibility into my software supply chain. It's a very top of mind. I'm, so, so those are the, some of the differences, but you're right. Like, uh, I, 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 that was a very interesting regional distinction as well. How do you take this data mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> bring it back to your customers to kind of close the loop? Do you do that? Do you say, okay, hey, mm -hmm. we're going to mm -hmm. share this data with you, get real time feedback. That's yes. what we often like to do that with data. Absolutely. Say, okay, because you, know, you know, when you do a survey like this, you're like, oh, I wish we asked A, B, and C, mm -hmm. but it gives you, informs you as to where to double click. Yeah. Are you, is there a system to do that or yes, a process to yes. do that? Our, our hope and goal is to do this um, every year mm -hmm. and, and see how things are changing and then do some uh, historical analysis as to how things are changing as well. But as I said in the very beginning, I think we take this and we say, okay, uh, there's a lot of alignment in these areas, uh, especially for us, for our products, to see if where our products are deployed, to see if some of those numbers vary um, you know, per product because we address, as, as a company, we address a lot of these concerns. So then it, it's very encouraging to say, okay, with certain customers we're going to go, we're going to have develop certain metrics, and we're going to measure how much of a difference we're making with these stats. Well, I mean, if you can show that you're consolidating yeah. You know, the number of tools and show the business impact right. of yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Home run. Exactly, so yes. Speaking of business outcomes, you know, we have so many conversations around everything is, needs to be outcome based. Mm -hmm. Can security become an enabler of business outcomes for organizations? Absolutely. Um, security has to be an enabler. So it, it's, um, you know, back to the security lagging behind the evolution of the digi you know, digital transformation and SAC. I don't think it's possible to move fast without having security move fast with digital transformation. I don't think anybody would raise their hands and say, I'm just going to have the most creative, most interesting digital transformation journey, but you know, security is safe. So I think we're past that point where uh, I think generally people do agree that security has to run as fast as um, digital transformation and really enable those business outcomes that everybody's proud of. Um, so yes, yes, it, so, it is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, so chicken and egg. Digital transformation, cyber transformation. How yes. are they related? Is one they digital are, leading? They are two halves of, of the perfect solution. They without they have to coexist because otherwise, if you're taking a, a lot of risk with your digital transformation, is it really worth going through a digital Great transformation? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So 
there's a board over here. I'm looking mm -hmm. at it, and it started yeah. out blank. Yeah. And it's what's next in cyber. And That's basically, this. Yes. people can come through, and they mm -hmm. can write down. And there's some great stuff in there: 5G, cloud native, some technical stuff, yeah. automated Automation. mean time to repair, to yeah. remediation. Yeah. Somebody wrote AWS. The yeah. AWS yeah. guys yeah. left their mark, which is kind <laughs> of cool. Great. And so I'm wondering. So we always talk about. We just talked about earlier that cyber is a board has become a board level, mm -hmm. you know, issue. I think even go back mid last decade, it was really mm -hmm. starting to gain strength. What I'm looking for, and I don't know if there's anything in here that suggests this, is going beyond the board. So it becomes this top-down mm -hmm. thing, not just the, the SOC, not just the you know, IT, not just the board. Now it's top-down, mm -hmm. maybe it's bottom-up, middle out, that awareness across the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's something that I think is, that is a next big thing in cyber, I, I believe it's coming. Cybersecurity awareness is a topic, uh, and you know there are companies who who do that, who actually educate just all of us who work for corporations um, on the best way to tackle, if, especially when the human is the is the source and the reason, knowingly or unknowingly, mostly unknowingly, of cyber attacks. Their education and awareness is critical in preventing a lot of this before our you know, tools even get in. So I agree with you that there is a, a cybersecurity awareness as a topic is going to be very, very popular in the, in, in the Lena future. Lena Smart is the CISO of uh, MongoDB. Does, I forget mm -hmm. what she calls it, but she basically takes the top security people mm -hmm. in the company, like the super geeks, and puts them with those that know nothing about security. Mm -hmm. And they start having conversations. Yeah. And then so they can sort of be empathic to each other's yeah. point of view. Absolutely. And that's how she, gets the organization to become cyber aware. Yes. It's, it's brilliant, it's so it simple. It, yeah. Exactly, right? well that's the beauty in it, is the simplicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are programs, uh, just to, to put a plug, there are programs where you can simulate, for example, phishing attacks with your you know, employee yeah. base and yeah. your, your, your yeah. workforce, and then teach them at that moment when they fall for it, you know, uh, what they should have done. I think I can imagine yeah. family game yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious, yeah. that's a good little yeah. exercise yeah. for everybody. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, is. it, yes. it really is, especially as the sophistication yeah. and smishing gets more and more yes. common these days. Yeah. Where, Zainab, where can folks go to get their hands on this juicy survey that we well, just we have We have it online. Um, so if you go to the Palo Alto Network's website, there is a m big link to the survey uh, from there. So for, for sure there's a summary version that you can come in and you can have access to all the stats. Excellent, Zainab, it's been such a pleasure having you on the program, dissecting what's keeping CXOs up at night, what Palo Alto Networks is doing to really help organizations mm -hmm. digitally transform uh, cyber transformation and achieve that nirvana of cyber resilience. We appreciate so much your insights. Thanks very much, it's been a Great pleasure. You. Thank you. For Zainab Ozdemir and Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live and emerging tech coverage.